So where did the field of cognitive psychology come from? What's the historical context? Well, humans have been thinking about thinking forever. Um, and I'm just going to point out a couple of interesting historical points rather than go through the entire history. The first one comes from a French philosopher named Descartes, who said, je pense donc je suis. Translation is, I think, therefore I am. Um, according to Descartes, what we're studying in this class, cognition, is what defines us as human. It what differentiates us from non-humans. Um, people have argued for centuries um, in cognitive psychology about how much our experiences depend on learning and how much of the way we say use language or imagine um, a trip somewhere depends on what we're born with the nature versus nurture debate that you've heard a ton about in your other classes and a Greek philosopher named Aristotle proposed that we are born with what he called a blank slate, a tabula rasa. In other words, your brain is basically empty at birth. That was his theory. Um, and if your brain is empty at, at birth, then it must mean that um, everything you remember and learn and think about and consider and all the judgments that you make, they all come from experience. Um, historically, the first lab in psychology um, was built in Germany by this man, Wilhelm Wundt. Wundt, I like to think of as psychology's baby daddy. Uh, he is the founding father of the field. Before, psychology used to be in the department of philosophy or maybe in the department of physiology. Um, and um, the University of Leipzig was the first time psycho cognitive psycholo psychologists, research psychologists, built a lab that was separate from philosophy and separate from physiological studies. Now, the technique that Wunder used, uh, Wundt used um, was something we don't really use today. It's called introspectionism. And that is um, to figure out how you do something, like uh, recognize that my teacup is a teacup. How do you recognize that? Well, what Wundt did was have subjects sit down and look at a cup and think in their minds, introspect, look inward, and decide what they were doing. So consciously describe your experience. Well, if you asked me to consciously describe what processes I use to recognize my teacup, I couldn't tell you the answer. And that's because a lot of cognitive processes are unconscious. Sometimes you'll hear the word implicit. Actually, as the semester goes on, you'll hear more about implicit processing, but processing that goes on um, below our awareness. Um, if you're talking about the first, some of the first research in cognitive psychology, then you've got to talk about this guy. Uh, Ebbinghaus, and we'll talk more about him later um, in the semester. Um, he was the first one to really conduct a study of memory. And the study that he conducted is a classic for students. It's basically a study of cramming. Now you cram for an exam when you don't really understand the material. And remember in the previous mini lecture we talked about the importance of meaning, right? If you understand something, you can remember it. But if you don't understand it, it's hard to remember. Hence what students traditionally find themselves doing right before an exam, cramming, trying to just get as much of that meaningless information into their brain as they can. That's exactly what Ebbinghaus did. He was his only subject. He memorized lists of letters, nonsense syllables are called letters that are arranged so that they um, don't have any meaning, right? So you wouldn't have the letter C-A-T, right? But you might have T-C-A, all right? So he'd create this list of nonsense syllables and memorize them, these meaningless lists, until he could report them back, he could reproduce them perfectly. Then once he got to the point that he knew the list perfectly, he would wait varying amounts of time and then try to reproduce 
right, retrieve and write down all of the letters that he could remember. And what you find on Ebbinghaus's famous forgetting curve is that, you know, cramming really doesn't work very well. It's very inefficient because within about the first 20 minutes, you lose about half of the meaningless information that you had memorized. And from that first 20 minutes until the next day, you basically lose another half. Um, you do keep a bit of it, about 20% of it, you can remember for a month or more, but you forget the vast majority of what you try to remember um, if what you're trying to remember doesn't make sense. The best way to study for an exam is to understand the material, not just memorize it. Um, I also need to mention the work of an American named William James, who was uh, the most influential psychologist in America for a very long time. He didn't run experiments. He just um, basically did introspectionism, thought about his own experiences, which limited what he could study. But he, he um, came up with ideas, really influential ideas, about what, what is truth, what defines truth, and what defines um, your free will. Um, for cognitive psychology, I think what he's most uh, well known for is his work on attention. And he actually came up with a definition of attention that still holds today. He said, attention is the taking possession by the mind in clear and vivid form of one out of what seems several simultaneously possible objects or trains of thought. It implies, that is, attention implies withdrawal from some things in order to deal more effectively with others. So people who are on their cell phone while they're driving, you pay attention to the conversation that you're hearing or texting, and that necessarily means that some of your cognitive, cognitive processes, that attentional process, are being taken away from the task of driving. Okay. Let's fast forward hundreds of years to the first actual cognitive psychology experiment. And that was conducted in the 1800s by a Dutch uh, eye doctor, an ophthalmologist um, named Donder. And um, what he did was he was the first person to measure reaction time. How long does it take you to react to something? If I stopped talking, how long would it take you to respond to that behavior? Um, so reaction time is the amount of time to respond to a stimulus. And what he did um, is just an elegant, simple test to figure out how long it takes for us to make a decision. That was his question. How long does it take for us to make a decision? Is that he compared a reaction time task with very little decision making to reaction time performance on reaction time tasks that required a key decision step. So the um, simple reaction time was just the simplest thing in the world. Imagine sitting in front of a computer, a flash comes on, you press a button. That's it, that's a whole study. Flash, press a button, flash, press a button. He compared that to what he called the choice reaction time task, where it would still be a flash of light, but the flash of light appearing on your computer, it could appear in four different places, position one, two, three, or four. And when it appeared in one of those places, you pressed a button, as with the simple reaction time task, but you had to press the button that corresponded to the location of the flash of light. Where is the flash of light? You had to decide which finger to push based on where the flash of light was. And what did Donder find? Well, he found that it took people about a tenth of a second, which we know we typically call milliseconds. We'll talk a lot in this class about milliseconds. A millisecond is when you take a second and divide it into a thousand pieces. Um, so a tenth of a second would be 100 milliseconds because 100 over a thousand is a tenth. So what Donner found was that it took people about a tenth of a second more, or 100 milliseconds, more time to do the choice reaction time task than the simple time, reaction time task. So Donder concluded, okay, it must take us about 100 milliseconds 
to make a decision. And that's our quick intro, historical intro to the history of cognitive psychology. But our next step is going to be a long one because behaviorism is key to the development of cognitive psychology.